This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Harley. Taylor is a, an art historian uh, who resides in Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, she's a third year doctoral student in art history at the Graduate Center, CUNY, uh, an associate member of the ANS and regular host of ANS Long Table Discussions. From 2018 to 2019, Hartley was the collections manager for the recent Medallic Art Company acquisition of the ANS uh, before spending her, uh, beginning her PhD program, uh, where she currently now is. And yesterday I'd mentioned uh, Taylor's role in the MAKO uh, acquisition that year and, and really uh, some of the work that she uncovered is partly you know, uh, the reason why we're here today. So again, that's, uh, it wasn't for nothing. And, uh, she specializes in 20th century sculpture of Europe and North America with particular interest in materiality and sculptural techniques. So please, uh, let's hear it for Taylor Hartley. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, and thank you, Jesse, for that lovely introduction. So I just want to start out today by saying that most often uh, people will meet uh, Brenner through his uh, most famous enduring work, uh, the Lincoln Penny. Uh, in fact, I imagine many numismatists started their collecting with pennies. Um, so did I. I have fond memories of examining pennies through a magnifying glass. While studying Brenner recently, I wondered why for me at least, I know this is the wrong <laughs> audience for that, the nickel or dime didn't hold the same fascination. I, wrong audience. <laughs> but I believe that Brenner's portrait of Lincoln uh, combines warmth, wisdom, and kindness in such a way that it invites beginners to the arts of coinage and portraiture. Lincoln is Brenner's most enduring public work of art. And uh, as was mentioned yesterday, one of the most widely disseminated works of art in human history. But it is not his only contribution to American art, as this presentation and the others here at COAC attest to. Critic Charles Henry Caffin included Brenner in his 1903 work, American Masters of Sculpture, and attributes his excellence as a medalist to, in his young adulthood, becoming, quote, conscious of having something beautiful within himself and having the determination to bring that to the surface. In his late career, Brenner shifted from uh, medallic art to sculpture in the round and completed a song to nature, a monumental mythological bronze. The sculpture, also called the Mary Shenley Memorial, was unveiled in 1918 in Pittsburgh's Shenley Park. The work was the culmination of Brenner's journey from seal cutter to sculptor in the round. In the century and since its unveiling, it also became a part of the fabric of Pittsburgh. The Shenley Memorial Fountain is a low basin of dappled granite an inscription at the front reads, a song to nature, pan the earth god, answers to the harmony and magic tones sung to the lyre by sweet humanity. Below this, faded and worn from rain and age, are the names of its creators, Victor David Brenner, sculptor, and H. Van Buren McGonagall, architect. Brenner's classicizing sculpture rests in an elevated tiered fountain basin. The two figures are the color of an old penny after restoration in 2008 to remove the green patina. Pan, the mature fawn with curling hair, pointed goat ears and horns, leans back against an ivy covered rock. His bulky twisting body wraps languidly around the base. One hoof is tucked close to his chest, while the other dangles off the edge. Over time, the fountain mechanisms have begun to leak, 
and a trickle of water drips between his cloven hoof. A partially nude female figure called Harmony rests above him, uh, rises above him. She too continues the spiral motion. Her body emerges from a long flowing drapery. She's partially nude and holds a lyre while dramatically turning her body to pluck its strings. Her facial expression, like Pan's, is serious and contemplative as she peers through the arc of her bent arm to gaze out at the park. Four bronze turtles rest in niches on the basin's lip. Their legs press against the fountain's edge as if they pulled themselves forward to peer over the edge with wide eyes. Robust streams of raw water flow from their mouths, creating a splashy spray that sounds like a waterfall. And here, I do have a video, but we'll see if it, oh yeah, there it works. <laughs> the sound delights the viewers and encourages them to circulate, viewing the fountain with the Cathedral of Learning on one side, the Frick Fine Arts Building on the other, and the trees that encircle the fountain like arms. A song to nature's history begins before Brenner's birth. Mary Elizabeth Crogan, an honor who, in whose honor the fountain was built, was born in Pittsburgh in 1826. Her maternal grandfather, Quartermaster General James O'Hara, was a Revolutionary War veteran and early industrialist in Pittsburgh. Her paternal grandfather, Major William Crogan Sr., was a Revolutionary War veteran and surveyor whose vast land holdings set his family up for success in the newly independent country. Shenley's father, William Crogan Jr., was Pittsburgh's largest landowner in the mid 19th century. He sent his only child, Mary, to an elite finishing school on Staten Island. Mary lived there in 1841 when she met the schoolmistress, Mrs. McLeod's brother-in-law, Captain Edward Wyndham Harrington Shenley, who was there to recover from an injury. Captain Shenley, a 43-year-old British foreign office official, was a Waterloo veteran, one-time friend of Lord Byron, an abolitionist. What ensued was a scandal. Mary was 14 when she eloped with Shenley to London. Even in 1842, this elopement was shocking. Pennsylvania legislature enacted Act 48, changing the legal age of marriage to 14, uh, to 15, sorry. One of Mary's cousins, James O'Hara, testified that she turned 15 within a month of her marriage. And I'd like to note here uh, that part of uh, the attempt to invalidate the marriage uh, may have been related to the fact that she had an enormous inheritance, um, uh, trying to keep it from, uh, from Shenley. What many, including scholar Ruth Salisbury, called one of Pittsburgh's great romances was Major Shenley's third elopement with a young woman. His first two wives died young, one in childbirth. A letter Mary wrote to her father just before Captain Shenley carried her off, which are his words, not mine, <laughs> to England, reveals her acquaintance with him in group activities, her humorous charm, and quite frankly, her immaturity. The letter reads in part, I wanted to get a cloak and bonnet, two very necessary articles for New Brighton, and I thought it would be better to tell you I want them before I bought them. Am I not an excellent good big girl? I think so. Goodbye, my dear Pa, if you do not write soon to your very affectionate daughter, Mary. P.S. Do you not think I am improving my writing? Despite Mary Crogan's age and immaturity, Captain Shenley made arrangements to marry her and take her to England. While Shenley declared that he had not used any undue means or arguments to induce your daughter to marry me, uh, her father, William Crogan, was shocked and horrified. The two were married on January 22nd, 1842. Mary left a letter to Mrs. McLeod uh, uh, explaining the 
reason for her absence and Captain and Mrs. Shenley boarded a ship to London under the false name Wyndham. After seven months without a letter from her father, Mary wrote him to entreat him to visit her in Suriname and ensure that she was safe and happy, happy with Captain Shenley as her husband. Although their marriage began with intrigue and subterfuge, the Shenleys lived a long, apparently happy life together. Mary went with Captain Shenley to Suriname, where he was stationed to enforce and ensure the abolition of slavery among English plantation owners. Mary and Captain Shenley later reconciled with Krogan in Pittsburgh, and he reinstated her inheritance and bought the Shenleys a house in London. The couple had nine children in 36 years of marriage, two of whom married into English aristocracy. Mary Shenley remained enmeshed with the city of Pittsburgh, although she did not often return. Wealth from both her mother and father that was administered through a family trust, eventually through deaths and other circumstances, uh, came uh, to uh, Mary uh, alone, and she gained control, sole control of the O'Hara Krogan fortune. She did not take full control or begin to liquidate the holdings until her husband died in 1872. These land holdings in Allegheny County and Mary Shenley's phil philanthropic nature made her one of the great patrons of Pittsburgh, although at the time of her death in 1903, she had not visited in 30 years. Shenley donated the Fort Pitt blockhouse, all that remains of Fort Pitt from 1764 to the Daughters of the American Revolution in Pennsylvania. She donated land for hospitals, schools, and parks. In 1890, Shenley donated 300 acres of land for the public park that would bear her name. Pittsburgh industrialist Andrew Carnegie built his library, museum, and university on land donated by Shenley. In 1895, Carnegie donated $100,000 for a memorial to Mary Shenley in her park, but the Pittsburgh Arts Commission did not convene the competition until 1911. The competition was open to any sculptor with broad parameters. Uh, the only guidance was that it be a fitting memorial to Mary Shenley. According to contemporary art writer Grace Humphrey, more than 20 designs were considered by the committee, including an obelisk, a chariot, several arches, <laughs> and one pyramid with a group of laborers. A surviving submission from the University of Pittsburgh Library shows a sculpture of a standing goddess, uh, perhaps intended to stand in for Shenley, holding flowers and a building at the center of a fountain. Um, and uh, this is actually a very good photo. Uh, I can send it to anyone who wants to look closer. She's holding a domed building and uh, this, um, a spray of flowers in one arm. Brenner submitted a plaster model for A Song to Nature in 1911, and the site uh, and model were approved by the Pittsburgh Arts Commission in 1913. Brenner's submission won by a unanimous vote, and after the committee confirmed the plaza design in 1916, Brenner began sizing up his model to create his first monumental sculpture. And this is uh, presumably what uh, part of his um, submission what looked like. This intermediate stage here sh uh, shows the figures at life size as Brenner worked on the weight and physical anatomy of the figures. Um, and this, uh, uh, to, to point out here, you can see uh, relief of Lincoln in the back here. This Peter A. Julian son photograph captures the statue at its full size. Brenner stands in his smock with the finished plaster. The statue towers above him in a studio shed, ready to be cast in bronze. The top of Brenner's head is even with Pan's knee, 
indicating that he has sized the statue up from a small plaster to 15 feet tall. From its final placement atop McGonagall's granite fountain, the tip of the female figure's head is 30 feet high. The resulting fountain fills its landscape space. Renner's statue is still large enough to make an impact in 2021, despite its proximity to Charles Clowder's 42-story Cathedral of Learning skyscraper. Renner's finished product was his first and unfortunately final monumental public sculpture. In Brenner's late career, he began to experiment with sculpting the human body in the round, which exercised a different set of skills from those used in metal and bas relief. Brenner was a master of relief. These two portraits, uh, the Theodore Roosevelt plaquette and Mademoiselle Furtbauer at the piano show the painterly play of relief levels that made Brenner's medals so evocative. His figures rise up from the surface and dip back down as though emerging from the malleable surface of the metal. The portrait of Roosevelt is one of Brenner's masterpieces. Roosevelt's face stands out with every solemn detail from his knitted brow to his determined gaze and messy hair. Roosevelt's suit and pocket watch, on the other hand, melt effortlessly into the silver-plated copper. A Song to Nature is an experiment in solidified volumes in three dimensions, a striking departure from the gauzy, wispy film of much of his relief work. Brenner had already completed the preliminary model by 1911 uh, when he submitted it, and in 1912, a smaller version was included in Brenner's exhibit at the Hollow Gallery. Uh, these, the skills required to sculpt nude figures in the round differ from those used in bas-relief, but Brenner's skills in relief come through in A Song to Nature. Humphreys wrote of the statue on its unveiling to this, his first big piece in the round, Mr. Brenner brings the qualities that have made his medallic art famed, a happy combination of poetry and passion. Brenner's training in medallic art also comes through in the composition. I would argue that a song to nature can be understood as a medal in the round. The obverse and the reverse are the most striking compositions. Although Pan's legs wrap around the base and encourage the viewer to circulate, the, um, the scene is more difficult to understand from the sides where both faces are obscured. This asymmetrical composition and the use of negative space between the two figures also echoes Brenner's medallic work. His portraits of Theodore Roosevelt and Mademoiselle Furchbauer have a diagonal composition from bottom left to upper right. Brenner transferred his medallic sculpting skills to sculpting on a heroic scale. On a close look at A Song to Nature, the viewer begins to grasp the inherent difficulties in scaling a small plaster model to 15 feet tall. The minute painterly details of his medallic work did not transfer to the size of a memorial. Instead, Brenner opted for a more academic, resolved finish to focus on the nude bodies of Pan and Harmony. His focus on anatomy is a courageous artistic choice for his first monument. While his bodies are supple and skillful, his proportions reveal that this is a test in heroic anatomy. Pan's arms and legs are long and large. Harmony's arm is a bit too long for her torso as well. In many ways, A Song to Nature is as much a monument to Brenner's growth as an artist as an honorific sculpture. He was poised at what he hoped would be the next phase of his career emerging from relief into the round to make a name for himself in memorials and monuments. 
Another photo of Brenner's studio, and I think that uh, my colleague might talk about this, um, uh, uh, shows a song to nature reflected in a mirror, which you can see uh, back behind this uh, seated figure. And, and uh, this is a model for submission to another monument competition, this one for the Fort Recovery Monument in Ohio. The Mary Shenley Memorial Project should have been the beginning of a new phase for Brenner, but he was already too ill to attend the unveiling ceremony in 1918. Julie's photo of the sculptor standing with pride beside his monumental effort is unfortunately uh, towards the end of his career. The reviews of the statue were good, however and his first foray into heroic academic sculpture deemed a success. Humphreys wrote, he has given it a treatment academic, if you will, but tempered by his own passionate love for sheer beauty. Brenner's academic classicizing treatment of the body echoes its mythological subject matter. The central figure of a song to nature is the god Pan, although the figure was called a fawn, uh, possibly in its early phase. The goat-legged god Pan has taken on many attributes since his emergence in Greece in the 6th century BCE. At times he was a god of shepherds, uh, a primordial earth god, a figure associated with music and dance, and a representation of predatory fertile sexuality. With regards to Brenner's Pan, Humphreys writes, old but ever young, Pan is the actual workman of the earth according to ancient mythology and represents the miracle of regeneration, the birth of all life. Her statement, however, does not reflect the whole of Pan's ancient or contemporary context. As a member of the retinue of Dionysus or Bacchus, the god of wine, Pan was associated with a drunken revelry and virile fertility. This association continued into the late 19th century when two American sculptures created public statues of Bacchus's cohort. In 1893, sculptor Frederick William McMoneys completed Bacchant and Infant Fawn, a sculpture of a nude female worshiper of Bacchus joyously dancing with grapes held high in her right hand and an infant squirming in her left. McMoney's completed this vivacious sculpture in 1894, and architect Charles McKim, then working on the Boston Public Library, sought to place it in a fountain in the central court. The trustees of the library endorsed the statue, and it was placed in the library. A scandal ensued as people began to question the placement of a nude, probably inebriated Bacant in a public library, a place of moral and intellectual learning. The ensuing controversy attracted national press coverage. McMoney's Bacant was the face and body that launched a thousand satirical cartoons. Public outcry from an intense, outspoken minority was so overwhelming that McKim, who intended to memorialize his wife with the statue, withdrew the gift from the public library in 1897. He then offered the statue as a gift to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, where it is still on display, and you can see it today. The New York Herald called Bacant and Infant Fawn on the, uh, on the occasion of its movement to New York uh, too naughty for Boston Library. And many New Yorkers accepted the statue with pride as a sign of artistic taste and superiority. Some, however, had the same fears that it would corrupt the people of New York. Another statue faced similar censorship at this time, again with a Bacchanalian theme, and one that is very similar uh, to what Brenner pursued. George Gray Barnard's The Great God Pan was donated to the city of New York in 1896 and rejected by the Parks Commission. It was intended for Central Park, but a similar controversy kept it from being displayed there. At one point, it was displayed at the Met, alongside McMoney's Bacant, prompting this cartoon in the New York Evening Telegram. The Two Orphans depicts the two statues side by side as if bonded by their censorship. 
Pan's pipes have been replaced by a foaming mug of beer and the Bacant's grapes with a pot of Boston baked, be Boston baked beans. Bar Barnard's pan finally settled into a permanent home on the campus of Columbia University in 1908, three years before Brenner's pan won the Shenley competition by a unanimous vote. Brenner's choice of subject matter was daring for a public memorial, especially because of the interplay between Pam and Pan and the nymph Sweet Harmony. Uh, the relationship between Pan and an unnamed or an unnamed fawn and a nymph is one of pursuit, frustration, and temptation. Brenner's teacher, uh, Louis Oscar Roti, created this medallion in 1880, depicting a nymph and fawn dancing. Their composition within the circular metal prompts the viewer to imagine them spinning around. She leans back while he pulls her forward, his eyes locked on her in a direct lascivious stare. When Brenner was working on the final statue, this relationship had expanded into music and dance as well. In 1912, the Ballet Russe mounted a, pro a production of La Prémidie d'une Fawn in Paris. The ballet, performed to Claude Debussy's interpretation of a poem of the same name by Stéphane Mallarmé follows a fawn for the 12 minute duration of the symphonic poem. The fawn was performed and choreographed by Václav Nijinsky. Nymphs enter and exit the stage followed by the fawn whose desire for them prompts him to chase them and caress them. A graphic sexual scene as well as the jerky movements of the dancers uh, posed like antique Greek vase paintings, prompted yet another scandal debated in the international press about the nature of ballet and obscenity. The company brought the ballet to New York in 1916, where reviewers remarked on Nijinsky's skill as a dancer and the removal of the most graphic movements. The dance and subject matter still carried this reference to sensuality in the 1980s, uh, when Freddie Mercury reprised the role of the fawn in the music video for I Want to Break Free. Uh, David Eagling choreographed an homage to Nijinsky in this famous music video that was also deemed scandalous by American moral standards. Ironically, it was not the reference to the erotic fawn that made American censors squeamish, but the comedic cross-dressing in the rest of the video. Members of the band dressed as housewife characters from the British soap opera Coronation Street as a comedic send up of the show and American television producers balked at the idea of playing it on the air. Amidst all this scandal and concern about propriety, Brenner's pan and harmony did not face the same scrutiny or censorship. The uproar about the initials VDB on the Lincoln Penny received much more press than ba uh, Brenner's Bacchic subject matter. Um, and in part, I think this is because Brenner's treatment of the figures keeps them within the realm of propriety. Although the figures are partially nude, neither is as exposed or challenging to the viewer as Barnard R. McMoney's artworks. Pan's gaze is contemplative and remote, perhaps even distracted. Harmony's face is equally severe and stoic, and they do not touch. The space between them is both physical and, um, and metaphorical, as the only exchange between them is via the music from her lyre. Another possible explanation for the change in attitude regarding Pan is what art historian Daniel Robbins calls a shift from statues to sculpture. After the First World War, artists began to slowly challenge the supremacy of the Beaux-Arts sculptural style. In 1913, the Armory Show in New York jolted the American art world by introducing America to paintings and sculptures by the European avant-garde. By the time A Song to Nature was completed and unveiled, its style was more conservative than the artworks currently causing consternation and outrage. Brenner's pan, while not exactly tame, fits within the natural wildness of the park. As uh, Humphreys wrote in 1918, something of this sense of the park and the city underlies the conception of a song to nature. Pan the earth god, listening to music, responds by beating time. 
As she points out, part of the beauty of Brenner and McGonagall's fountain is its site specificity as a public work of art. Brenner's 1909 portrait of Abraham Lincoln on the Lincoln Cent remains his foremost public work of art, uh, while this, his sole monumental sculpture, is one of his most obscure. The Mary Shenley Memorial is obscure, perhaps, to people who have never lived in Pittsburgh. But it has been a part of the fabric of the city since its unveiling in 1918. I can get this slide to advance. Don't worry, I got it. There we go. <laughs> uh, so this photograph from 1936 shows uh, Shenley Plaza from the 14th floor of the neo-Gothic skyscraper on the University of Pittsburgh's campus. From this viewpoint, one can see the Mary Shenley Fountain in the center, surrounded by landscaped terrain and young trees. The fountain rests between the Carnegie Institute and Forbes Field, with the natural, natural landscape of Shenley Park behind it and the riverside and hills in the distance. The Pittsburgh Pirates played at Forbes Field from 1909 to 1970, and while the trees filled in, the fountain would have been visible from the cheap seats at the top. The field has since been demolished, but there is still a small grassy ball field dedicated to Hall of Famer Bill Mazeroski, located right next to the Shenley Memorial. Generations of baseball fans walked past the fountain on the way to watch their team play or saw it in the distance while hoping for a home run. The fountain played host to parks and recreation celebrations as well. These two photographs from a 1935 Halloween celebration show children in costumes leaning over the edge of the granite basin. Clowns, a shepherdess, and children in Polish dance costumes pose around the fountain. Some lean in, others smile and laugh. Uh, one clown frowns in contemplation, the other pulls a comedic grimace. And in the other photo, a Polish dance troupe performs with Brenner's statue looking on in the backdrop. They take a bow as if to the tune of Harmony's Lyre. In the 1940s, Pittsburgh Courier photographer Charles Teeny Harris became a fixture of the African American community in Pittsburgh. As the paper's only photographer, he learned to put his subjects at ease and bring their personalities through. He often did so in one shot, as conserving film was necessary. In the mid 1940s, Harris used the Shenley Fountain as a backdrop for multiple portraits and candid photographs of residents of the Oakland neighborhood and students from Shenley High School. On the left is his portrait of a woman named Ruth Simmons wearing a suit with flowers behind each ear. Harris captured her with an authentic smile on her face as if she climbed up on the fountain's edge in a moment of joyful abandon. On the right, Harris returned to the fountain to catch a snapshot of two women looking off to the side, as if, in, uh, as if watching someone outside the frame. Behind them, two men in suits sit on the fountain's edge, engaged in conversation, although if you look closely, one of the men seems aware of the women sitting feet away. Harris's photos, as well as those of the Halloween celebration, reveal the ways in which Brenner's statue wove its way into the lives of many over the century since its dedication. It has been restored twice in recent years. Once in 1989 to restore the turtles. The, uh, the turtles had, uh, several of the turtles had been uh, stolen or removed throughout the century. Um, and uh, in 1989, uh, they were all uh, replaced along with the fountain mechanism. So instead of that gentle trickle of water visible in Harris's photos from the 1940s, more water is pumped through the fountain at a time. That rushing spray of water has led to a colorful nickname. The Pittsburgh Post-Gazette reports that 
after the 1989 conservation restored the turtles, it earned the nickname Turtle Spit Fountain and is a beloved spot for children to play. A Song to Nature was Brenner's gift to Shenley's memory, to the people of Pittsburgh and visitors of every age. And it is my hope that this paper puts Brenner's sculpture back into circulation. Thank you. Oh, we have a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. So uh, I have two questions. First, um, you gave an explanation of why this sculpture was not as controversial as some other treatments of Pan around that time. But um, is there any indication in the sources of why the Pittsburgh Arts Commission thought that this was an appropriate symbol to commemorate Shenley, as opposed to some of the other designs you mentioned, which seem to um, refer more directly to her as a patron of the arts? No, I, I haven't uh, found any reasoning behind that. And I'm hoping that uh, possibly uh, in the future, uh, as it's close to COVID, I can actually see some of the Arts Commission's um, records. Uh, but I, my guess as a, uh, an art historian is that um, his statue is uh, much more beautiful than, than uh, the things that uh, were uh, the, uh, the other statues that were pitched. Um, and in part, uh, I do believe that part of it was because of the park, um, because it is uh, site specific, uh, there is a sense of, um, of music, of earthliness and of a pastoral quality that uh, you know, Pan carries with him that I do think that part of that uh, may have gone hand in hand with it. And I also think that it's possible that uh, uh, his name carried, carried some weight with uh, the people who uh, were, were, choosing, uh, these, uh, were choosing these models. I mean, I, um, I think that uh, I, don't I don't know, know who, who else, else was uh, submitting. But I believe that uh, the combination of the fact that it is, quite frankly, a very nice looking sculpture and the fact that Brenner's name, uh, you know, was a, a pretty big name, um, you know, in, in terms of uh, relation to the penny and uh, that, that maybe uh, some combination of the two would be my guess. in the round did Brenner have any training in sculpture or did he or was he self-taught so I think that uh I don't know if Scott will cover this a little bit but he does have he does have some training um and he did take uh courses in uh some of his courses at uh now I don't know he didn't go to art students league um, uh, where is his, it's the design, uh, design academy. Yeah. Yes. So, so well, so I uh, hang on to that, so hang on to that. Um, and, uh, Scott will, will discuss it, but, uh, but yes, um, I do think that, um, and I also think that part of the reason that I found, uh, Barnard and McMoney's, uh, a compelling comparison is that, uh, this is all happening around the time that he is in art school. And so this is something that, um, I, well, as someone who has gone to art school, the, the art scandal of the day is, is something that, that people talk about, that they discuss. And so I think that um, you know, it's possible that he was uh, aware of, of some of these goings on. Thank you. Uh, Taylor, thank you very much for that wonderful talk. Um, the question that I have, if we look at Brenner's career, he starts off as an engraver, you know, very small things, um, then uh, progresses towards a medallic artist, 
working in fall relief, plasters, things of the sort, and then eventually um, in large scale, very large scale, sculpture on the round, in, in the case of this fountain. Um, if, if we compare that to the tra trajectory of a lot of other contemporaries like McMoney's, where they start off as sculptors working in larger, you know, um, sculpture in the round or bas relief, and then on occasion will do smaller medallic uh, type things. Do, do we have any sense of why Brenner decided to really push himself and push his art into this much, much larger format? I mean, was, was this simply um, uh, artistic challenge, or was it more, uh, say, economically based in the sense that he saw, you know, the potential for larger commissions and um, uh, essentially more income from this type of larger work? Uh, thank you. That's, That's a, great a great question. I do think that um, uh, Scott will probably have a little bit more uh, to say on that. Uh, my uh, feeling gut feeling and related to my research uh, is is partly uh, related to prestige. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I, I do think that those statues uh, and in particular public memorials have a sense of prestige to them. Um, and it is challenging. Uh, you know, it is it is very challenging. So I, I get the sense that uh, as somebody through his career who was constantly challenging himself, moving to the next thing, constantly, uh, you know, going back, learning more, doing more, that that part of it is a, a matter of uh, feeling that it's growth. Um, but we'll see if we'll see if Scott agrees with me. <laughs> So much. Um, do we know why Brenner uh, himself kind of gravitated towards uh, those two allegorical figures? I don't, and I'm. Uh, I'd I'd love to uh, sort of dive into that a, a little bit more because this is actually quite different for him. Uh, it, you know, even his uh, other sculptural work doesn't kind of have the same. Um, uh, uh, allegorical subject matter. And I think that um, part of it, uh, and I would love to do as I go on, I, I really think that uh, the, the connection between the great god Pan and this is, is actually one that I'd like to take a look, the Barnard statue and, and this, because the Barnard statue actually ends up in a fountain at one point. And so I, I think that that in particular uh, might have been something that he's thinking about. But I also think that um, experimenting with this uh, allegorical and in particular anatomical body um, is a sign of sculptural mastery. Uh, and so I don't know exactly what this particular group of, uh, of figures uh, meant to him, and I'm. Uh, that's something that I'd be interested in, sort of working out uh, through further research. But I get the sense that part of it was about the body and was about uh, exploring that because that's what those, as uh, as Peter points out, uh, sculptors who are trained in in sculpting and then go into medallic arts, they're trained in. Uh, you know, creating uh, an, an, a proper anatomical body. And so I think that that part of that for him is about movement, is about uh, twisting figures, and is about uh, showing that he really can can do that. Um, because it's, mm -hmm. it's not, it's not easy, especially if you're, uh, you know, not, um, uh, if you're even if you're trained, if you're not practiced over and over again in that uh, uh, depiction of the body. So. We can't we can't hear on Zoom if someone's asking a question. Check check. All right. Uh, yeah, those two uh, subjects in particular seem good for a study because uh, you have one. Uh, at rest, and you have one kind of upright and standing in a in a kind of strenuous position. So you, yeah, uh, if it is a strict 
you know, uh, study of the body. Yeah, you, you couldn't have picked two better subjects. I think that he's uh, he's he's really and working on different uh, different uh, positioning of the body as well. You know, there's that um, uh, sense of of movement, especially with Pan's legs, with the wrapping, um, and with uh, Harmony's figure up uh, up rising up above. Can you hear me all right, Kayla? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so I have. You, you talked a little bit about the, the controversy around the Shinley marriage. And it's kind of, I, I, I don't know if you're quite suggesting this or if anyone else made this kind of connection or the comp, gave commentary um, at the time, uh, but was there any thought around this kind of the, uh, the pan, pan, creepy, older, predatory sort of? You know, it is, thank you for mentioning that. That was something that I debated, like how, you know, I, because I've been staring at this for so long, thinking about it for so long, uh, sometimes it's the two of them to me, and sometimes it's not. And sometimes, um, you know, and, and I debated how much of a full connection I wanted to draw between that. I think that there, may have been an, an association there, I, I do. Um, I also think that, um, I mean, uh, you know, he is, Pan is the, the, the sort of, uh, you know, um, you know uh, musical uh, tempter figure. And also uh, then in uh, the late 19th century related to, uh, you know, some people conflate him with, uh, the 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 devil as well, you know that they say that oh well that's he became you know that's that's what Pan became in, in the Christian era. Um, but I think that um, uh, I think that uh, you know I'm glad that you kind of picked up on that, and I'm not sure quite how much is there. To me, I think it's there sometimes. To me, I think you know. Maybe not, but uh, you are uh, you are right in that it was on my mind. <laughs> oh, this, is this a question here? Oh, the, I'm looking at the teleprompter. <laughs> oh, it's a it's a comment. Thank you. Are there any other questions in the chat, Austin? I don't. I don't have any right now. Um, if you, I, I think it's. I mean, the the comment is um, is is lovely. So I'll read it out for folks who, who don't have access to the to the chat here. Um, from um, uh, it says um, the this sculpture is beautiful. Mr. Brenner successfully creates two figures weighing thousands of pounds and made harmony weightless, floating, defying gravity. Her arm hooks around, bringing the viewer's interest to the pan figure. It's captivating and magnificent for an artist who worked mostly on a much smaller scale. So it's, it's what you capture. It really is. And the size is impressive when you see it. You know, I, I see a lot of big statues and um, it, was, uh, it was still impressive to see in person, especially with uh, all the water and, and the big fountain surrounding it as well. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.